Aloha. I'm Lyle Lishida, Chief of the FCC's Consumer Affairs and Outreach Division, and welcome to the FCC's public webinar on spoofing and robocalls for consumers in Hawaii. Right now, you may be asking yourself a couple of questions. One, why is the FCC doing a public outreach event for a specific state's consumers? And two, why Hawaii? Well, the second question is the easiest to answer. Last month, the Hawaii State Attorney General, Claire Connors, issued a statewide alert about spoofed numbers passively being used to fraudulently get personal information from Hawaii residents. Robocalls and spoofing are the FCC's number one complaint topic from across the country and specifically from Hawaii. So we wanted to try and lend a hand in working with state governmental officials to bring awareness about the program as well as solutions accessible to consumers in Hawaii. The first question, why are we doing a live event for a specific state is e e easily answered as well. We are trying out a new outreach event strategy whereby we at the FCC would work with officials from states and municipalities to bring local familiar faces to people in specific areas. We know that consumers trust local officials and personalities. And by working together with Hawaii officials, we may be more effective to reach consumers. Will this model completely replace how we do virtual outreach events and webinars? No, that's not the plan. The FCC's webinars are well received by outreach partners and consumers from across the country. But with this, this example of a targeted webinar, we could be adding another tool in our outreach and public engagement toolbox for use in our future. If you are viewing this event from a state outside of Hawaii, we invite you to stick around for some important information about robocalls and spoofing. And if you'd like the FCC to try and work a similar event in your state or municipality, feel free to drop us a line. The email address is the same one we now invite our audience to use if they want to submit a question to one of our panelists. And that email address is outreach at FCC.gov. Again, that's outreach at FCC.gov. So now I'd like to introduce our co-host for this event, speaking of local faces. Diane Akko is an award-winning journalist and a co-anchor and the host of Living Wealth. Diane, welcome to the webinar and thank you for doing this. Kyle, thank you so much. I'm so flattered that uh, the FCC would think to ask me to help co-moderate this event. And I know that uh, I probably speak for a lot of locals when I say that we in Hawaii are flattered that this government agency chose to try Hawaii as a test market because you thought we were a great example of uh, community cooperation and collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I know in your role as a reporter, you talk to so many people every day. So have you run into people you ha who have experienced um, robocalls and spoofing and difficulties associated with that? Yes, have I ever. Um, I am the host of Aging Well, which is a once a week segment within the newscast of KITV4, which for those of you who don't live in Hawaii is the ABC affiliate in this state. And so I'm constantly presenting stories about um, how seniors can age well. And part of that is to hang on to their money. So I have interviewed the Better Business Bureau, uh, the DCCA, which happens to be on this call, um, uh, with a lot of uh, stories and advice about spoofing or robocalls and what a serious problem it is. Oh, AARP also has talked to me about this. Um, I should like to mention that I will be producing a story on this seminar tonight for KITV4. So that'll be at 5, 6, and 10 here locally. And if you're on the mainland and you want to see it, then you can live stream us. Check us out on KITV.com or download our KITV app and look for the live stream. Okay, that plug is over. <laughs> but people like to know where they where they can see this stuff. I wanted to say on a personal note, you know, I have an 82 year old dad, and he's pretty savvy. But I still worry about anyone falling victim to uh, unwanted calls. And 
in a in an interesting coincidence, I have a personal friend in her, I think late 60s. She just lost four thousand dollars to a spoofing call last week that she's never going to recover. And luckily, she had the presence of mind to stop when they asked her for another five thousand dollars. So this really hits close to home, and um, I think it's a great idea that the FCC is trying this new kind of outreach. All right, thanks for that, and thank you for your stories. And and we feel for your friend, and and hope that uh, things get better. So that's the reason why uh, we're here to talk about robocalls and spoofing because it does present a uh, danger to the public. And so with that, why don't we just get started? Diane, take it away. Yeah, we're going to start with um, a video from Hawaii's Attorney General Claire Connors. Uh, she's going to just talk about the nature of the problem and why it's such a serious problem. Now, some of the numbers that I had received from the FCC in preparing for this panel was that the total number of complaints nationwide of unwanted calls is 209,000, mm -hmm. over 209,000. And for Hawaii specific, that would be 460 calls. Uh, that actually is a very, very small percentage um, of complaints as compared to the many unwanted calls that people are not reporting to the government. And we really don't know how much money uh, this costs people um, because again, this may not be reported. It could be in the hundreds of thousands or in the millions according to the DCCA. Um, so let's hear from Claire Connors now on why this is such a problem. Aloha, my name is Claire Connors and I am the Attorney General of the State of Hawaii. I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar on robocalls and spoofing, which is being sponsored by the FCC. It's very interesting how this webinar came to be because our department, specifically our Hawaii Criminal Justice Data Center, was the victim or target of a spoofing scam. Our number was used by bad actors to call various persons in our community. And we all know that if we see a number that perhaps has a local area code or comes from a state trunk, we might be more inclined to answer it. And that's what the concern and the fear was in this case. To address the possibility that persons in our community would become targets of this spoofing scam using our telephone number, we put out a public press release to advise the public not to answer the call or if they did, not to turn over any of their personal or sensitive information. It turns out Lyle Ishida of FCC saw the public release and he reached out to us to set up this opportunity to collaborate, to provide a good public re outreach opportunity to share information and to learn more from each other. We as a department are very committed to looking out for consumers and we do this job alongside our sister agency, the Office of Consumer Protection. I believe the executive director, Steve Levins, is participating today. So it's a wonderful opportunity for all of us to pull together and to learn from each other about how we can do this better, to learn how we can take what is more than just a nuisance, robocalls and spoofing, but is actually a targeted way of getting the sensitive information of people in our community and to combat it in more effective and efficient ways. So I'd like to say thank you in particular to all the persons who put this together, who are participating in the panel and specifically Lyle Ishida for reaching out and setting this up. I believe it's the first time the FCC has partnered with the state in this type of way. So although the circumstances leading to this partnership were unfortunate, we're very glad that the opportunity led to this moment. So thank you to everyone who's participating. Uh, I think this is gonna be a wonderful event and look forward to everything we're gonna learn. Thank you very much and aloha. And thank you, uh, Madam Attorney General. Uh, to get us started to talk about the problem, first from a national perspective, to give uh, folks in Hawaii a sense of what's going on all around the country, I'd like to bring and welcome to bring to the stream Kayla Hernandez Ujoa. Kayla is the Associate Chief of the FCC's Consumer Affairs and Outreach Division. And Kayla, um, take it away. Let's talk about the problem. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Kayla hernandez Ujoa, Associate Division Chief of the Consumer Affairs and Outreach Division. I will be providing an overview of spoofing and robocalls, also some tips to share with your communities that will help them address these issues and will conclude with several resources for more information. Advancements in technology make it easy to make massive number of robocalls and to spoof caller ID information to hide a caller's identity. 
the FCC knows that these calls are of major concern to millions of Americans, and scam calls can result in very real financial losses and serious consumer frustration. The agency is committed to using every tool at our disposal and working closely with private, public, and international partners to combat unlawful robocalls and spoofing. Spoofing is when a caller deliberately falsifies the information transmitted to your caller ID and to display a number that often can be identified with the intent to trick you into giving away valuable and personal information so that it could be used in fraudulent activity. Scammers often use what is called neighbor spoofing, so it appears that an incoming call from a local number is actually a valid call, and this will increase the likelihood that you will answer the call. To help combat neighbor spoofing, the FCC is requiring the phone industry to adopt a robust caller ID authentication system which allows consumers and law enforcement alike to more readily identify the source of illegal robocalls and reduce their frequency and impact. Called the Stir Shaken Framework, this is a set of technical standards and protocols that allow for the authentication and verification of call ID information for calls carried over internet protocol networks. As implementation continues to progress, it will give Americans more confidence that the caller ID information they receive is accurate and will allow voice service providers to provide helpful information to their consumers about which calls to answer. But let's go back to telephone numbers being blocked or labeled. So if you receive a call and the telephone number is blocked or labeled as a potential scam on your caller ID, it is possible that the number has been spoofed. Several phone companies and app developers offer call blocking and labeling services that detect whether a call is likely to be fraudulent based on call patterns, consumer complaints, or other means. The FCC rules do not prohibit call blocking or labeling technologies. However, the FCC is concerned about ensuring that lawful calls are completed and has encouraged providers who block calls to establish a means for a caller whose number is blocked to contact the provider and remedy the problem. You can legally block the transmission of your phone number when you make calls, so your number will not appear or will appear as unknown. Doing so is not spoofing. Under the Truth in Caller ID Act, FCC rules do prohibit anyone from transmitting misleading or inaccurate caller ID information with the intent to defraud, cause harm, or wrongfully obtain anything of value. Anyone who is illegally spoofing can face penalties of up to $10,000 for each violation. However, spoofing is not always illegal. There are legitimate times when a number can be spoofed. For example, when a doctor calls a patient from her personal mobile phone, but displays the office number, or when a business displays its toll-free number as its callback number. So now we move on to robocalls specifically. Robocalls are the FCC's top consumer complaint and our top consumer protection priority. The FCC is committed to doing what we can to protect consumers from these illegal calls and is cracking down on them in a variety of ways. So the FCC has issued hundreds of millions of dollars in enforcement actions against illegal robocallers. It has empowered phone companies to block by default illegal or unwanted calls based on reasonable call analytics before the calls reach consumers. Allowing consumer options on tools to block calls from any number that doesn't appear on a customer's contact list is also another option. And finally, it's making consumer complaint data available to enable better call blocking and labeling solutions. During the 2021 March Open meeting, Chairwoman Rosenworcel launched what is called the Robocalls Response Team to kick off efforts to combat unwanted robocalls and bring together commission efforts to enforce the law against providers of illegal robocalls. It also develops new policies to authenticate calls and educate providers and other stakeholders about what they can do to help. The chairwoman also delivered letters to the Federal Trade Commission, Department of Justice, 
and the National Association of State Attorney Generals to renew state federal partnerships to combat the proliferation of illegal calls. The letters expressed the chairwoman's commitment to fighting robocall scams by leveraging knowledge, skills, and jurisdictional reach of cooperating organizations to share critical investigative information and collaborate on cases. But again, not all robocalls are illegal. To determine if robocalls are illegal, there are several factors. There's the technology used to make the call, whether the call is on a landline or mobile number, whether the content of the call is telemarketing based and whether the number is on the national do not call registry. So the do not call rules apply only to telemarketing calls. Calls that do not have to comply with these rules include tax exempt nonprofit organizations, political organizations, pollsters and survey takers that are not making sales calls and religious organizations. FCC rules require telemarketers to allow you to opt out of receiving additional telemarketing robocalls immediately during a pre-recorded telemarketing call through an automated menu. The opt-out mechanism must be announced at the outset of the call and must be available to the duration of the call. And just quickly wanted to mention about something that might be of interest to consumers. This is election season in many states, counties, and municipalities. And as consumers, we will most likely be receiving an increase of calls from political campaigns. While campaign calls are exempt from the do not call list requirements, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act contains specific rules that they must follow. In general, robocalls to mobile phones require prior consent and calls to landlines are allowed without prior consent. Under FCC rules, voice providers may block calls without consumer consent when calls are from unassigned, unallocated, or invalid numbers and calls on the do not originate list. A voice provider may block calls that it deems are unwanted based on reasonable analytics, but the provider must allow their customers to opt out of this type of blocking. So it's not always easy to tell if an incoming call is spoofed. A red flag for identifying such a call is if you're being asked to share personal information such as your social security number, your mother's maiden name, or a bank account number during a call. The FCC's information for consumers for addressing spoofing scams, which we call tips, includes not answering calls from unknown numbers. Let the number go to voicemail, and if you do answer, hang up immediately. If you answer a call and the caller or recording asks for you to hit a button to stop getting these calls, immediately hang up. Don't respond to any questions, especially those that can be answered with a simple yes or no. Scammers often use these tricks to identify and then target respondents or use your yes reply to apply unauthorized charges to your bills. If you get an inquiry from someone who says they represent a company or government agency, hang up Call the phone number on your account statement or in the phone book or the company's or government agency's website to verify the authenticity of this request. You will usually get a written statement in the mail before you get a phone call from a legitimate source, particularly if the caller is asking for some type of payment. Talk to your phone company about call blocking tools and check into apps that you can download onto your mobile device. And as I mentioned before, consider registering your telephone numbers in the National Do Not Call Registry. You can do this by calling 888-382-1222. And for persons that do have access to the internet, they can do this on the website, do not call.gov. If you have lost money because of a scam call, contact your local law enforcement immediately for assistance. This is because some, there are many calls where the caller asks for payment using a gift card, and this is a red flag for a legitimate scan. And finally, some of the FCC's resources, which include our Consumer Help Center at FCC.gov consumers that contains more information about call ID and spoofing calls, the Consumer Complaints Center at consumercomplaints.fcc.gov, where you can file complaints, especially if you feel you've been the victim of a scam. And for consumers who do not have access to the internet, 
they can access the complaint system by calling 888-225-5322. The FCC scam glossary is also available for consumers to view at fcc.gov slash scam dash glossary containing information and tips not addressed here today on a variety of scams and con that consumers should be aware of. And finally, if anyone has any questions about information from the FCC, please contact the Consumer Affairs and Outreach Division by visiting our web page, fcc.gov slash outreach, or sending an email to outreach at fcc.gov. It's a pleasure providing information for you today, and I'd like to thank you for your attendance. Keila, thanks a lot. Really appreciate all of the information. Um, we're gonna go now turn it over to Diane for another speaker, Diane. Okay, thank you so much, Kayla and Lyle. Um, we're gonna take it down from the federal level to the state level now. So we're gonna to talk to Steve Levins, the executive director of the Hawaii Office of Consumer Protection, someone I've had the pleasure to interact with regularly over the last, should I even say it, Steve, 20 years? Uh, too long to repeat. <laughs> We both have a lot of archival knowledge in the but he's very good at what he does and he's going to continue talking about his office's work on uh, spoofing and robocalls as it relates to Hawaii stats. I don't want to st steal Steve's thunder, but he told me something rather shocking right before we started this, which was that he estimates that here in Hawaii, um, people with phones received over a million calls, unwanted calls in September alone. So take it away, Steve. Uh, thanks a lot, Diane, and aloha to everyone. Uh, my office is the Office of Consumer Protection, which is different than the Attorney General's office. Uh, Hawaii is unique in the sense that the consumer protection function is not handled primarily by the, uh, by the Attorney General's office. Here in Hawaii, it's handled by the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs and the Office of Consumer Protection. So one of the things that we have to do by law is create a depository of complaints in a, a central clearinghouse. And what we do is we get complaints from consumers here locally. We have relationships with other state consumer protectors and also federal law enforcement authorities. So this would include, you know, like I said, state AGs, uh, Federal Trade Commission, the FCC, and the CFPB. Well, you know, I reviewed all the complaints related to robocalling robo and spoofing in preparation uh, for this event today and really was shocked to see the numbers. It revealed that robocalling and spoofing is by far the most significant uh, it problem in the sense of that is troubling consumers here in Hawaii. Uh, we received last year approximately 600 people complaining who have alerted the authorities um, to this significant problem. I also, uh, as Diane mentioned, reviewed recent statistics for Hawaii. And you know, everyone knows that robocalling is a big problem. You have a phone, you get these calls on a daily basis, really. And just last September, we're talking about one month's worth of calls. There were uh, over 10 million calls that were placed to phone numbers here in Hawaii. That averages out to like almost 340,000 a day and about eight and a half per person. So it's a huge problem here in Hawaii, as well as the rest of the country. Uh, the topics that are associated with these robocalls and spoofing, uh, these are the main ones that, that we have discovered here in Hawaii. So you have scammers who are calling people here in Hawaii uh, about the, the person's Social Security payments. Uh, we have calls impersonating the police departments and law enforcement agencies, as uh, General Connors referred to. 
we have thousands and thousands of calls impersonating Amazon. We have calls involving our local financial institutions. And we also have had calls targeting Chinese immigrants. So to just give you some recent examples uh, regarding like a social security fraud. So scammers claiming to be federal agents uh, called people in Hawaii claiming to be with the social security administration. Uh, they said that the person's social security count was in jeopardy, was going to be canceled, and going to be charged a fine if they didn't pay it off with gift cards. Uh, they, they said that, well, we need to do this because your account is associated with fraudulent activity. Then to give their uh, themselves some kind of indicia of credibility and convince people that they were legitimate, uh, people would ask, well, who are you and what is this about? And they would give them fake badge numbers, uh, fake case and docket numbers, fake federal ID numbers. And this is all coming from a spoof telephone number to convince their victims. So the, the victim sees a number that may very well say the Social Security Administration. This has been a problem here in Hawaii and across the country. And in fact, uh, several months ago, several seniors showed up at the police department in Hilo, Hawaii, asking them about this scam. We've had other situations involving people getting telephone calls saying, there's a warrant for your arrest. You need to do something immediately. In fact, recently, a healthcare provider, now this was, this was someone with an advanced degree, they reported that, that they were victimized by a spoofing scam. They received a call um, left by voicemail message, supposedly from the Honolulu Police Department. Uh, the person called back the number and spoke with the police officer who didn't really know what, what the matter involved, but they said, well, if you get another number, let us know. Well, about 10 minutes later, the scammer called again. Again, the caller ID said HPD, so the, the person thought that they were dealing with the police department. Uh, the police, the person claiming to be the police officer said that a federal judge had issued a warrant for her failure to appear in court, claiming that she had uh, you know, signed a subpoena and just didn't show up. Because she didn't show up, the court issued a bench warrant. Uh, in fact, there, were, there was not one warrant. There were two federal warrants that had been issued, and the police were going to come to her house to arrest her. She was very concerned, obviously, and she expressed to the, to the caller that she knew what this was about. She had never been served with any kind of subpoena, and he said, well, we, I have your signature here, and the only way this can be rectified without coming to court or having us arrest you is if you pay off the court fees for the warrant, you got to do it today. So he had instructed her to go down and uh, purchase what's called a money pack card. It was also known as Green Dot. And these are widely available. They're sold at 7-Eleven, Walgreens, CVS, all retailers around the country and here in Hawaii. Ask their kid to get the to get the cards, scratch them off, and read the numbers to her. Well, that's what she did because she thought she was going to prevent herself from getting arrested. But what ended up happening is she lost two thousand dollars to this scammer. Uh, we also have received numerous complaints from people who say they've received calls from customs and border patrol agents, and that it, you know they they're gonna come and uh, arrest them because their name has been associated with drugs and money and money laundering. Uh, one of the more um, widespread robocalls that we've seen in the past year in Hawaii is associated with Amazon. Supposedly an Amazon rep calls, claims that the consumer um, was, account was used to purchase say an iPhone for $399. And 
the, the, this is done by a robocall. It's an automatic message. They, if they want more information, you know, they press the button and then they talk to a, a live person. The person says, well, you know, this is, uh, you know, I, I never charged anything to Amazon. I never ordered this kind of iPhone. So the scammer will say, well, we can take care of this, but I need to uh, get into your computer to see what is really going on. So they, they ask the consumer to download something called AnyDesk, which is a commercial program that allows someone else to actually access your computer. And the whole point here is they want to access your computer to do terrible things. And they end up putting malware on it. And, you know, it could be a, a reason for just stealing funds from you, or it could be um, to, I, to, to get your identity. It's, it's, it's something that is happening on a daily basis or an hourly basis here in Hawaii. Uh, finally, one of the other things that we've seen here in Hawaii relate to uh, Chinese robocalls. Uh, the robocalls are spoofed, and we've already hear, heard what, what that means. So the person gets uh, a call, when they, and it shows up as the Chinese consulate. And obviously, uh, the, most people who get these calls hang up because the, the, the call, the recording, initial recording is in Mandarin Chinese, and they don't understand it, and they just hang up. But what the scammers are hoping for is to, is to hit communities that have Chinese immigrants so they can prey on their insecurities and scam them. So uh, in, it, in, it takes place, the, the scheme works that, you know, the, the call comes from someone in the consulate and they say that uh, the victim needs to call the the Beijing Police Department because they're being investigated for financial crimes over in China. So if you're a Chinese immigrant, and you have family over in China, you can imagine how disconcerting to get a phone call like this is. Or another variation of the scam is that they say this is a consulate. This is the consulate. We have an important document that needs to be picked up. Um, it may affect your status in the U.S. Uh, press a button to speak with a specialist and uh, again, this, the whole point of this is to just scare the heck out of people and to steal money from them. It's been reported, widely reported, that there was a, an elderly woman in New York City who lost $2 million to this scam. So what are we doing to try to combat this fraud? I mean, it's, it's pervasive. What we've done in Hawaii is we've issued press releases. Every time I'm interviewed, I try to emphasize that no one should be paying for anything with a gift card or any kind of stored value card, because if anyone is asking you out of the blue, they're calling you up and they're telling you either to rectify a problem or to pay for something like this, it's going to be a scam. Uh, we have information on our website. Uh, we're also part of a multi-state working group that targets this problem, which the FCC participates in, and I would say most of the states are participating in. Uh, but, you know, as Lyle alluded to initially, unfortunately, despite all the publicity that's been surrounding this problem, people are still getting scammed. And it's only by getting the word out and alerting people of all these potential scams that we can try to prevent people from getting scammed in the future. And the FCC really should be commended for this campaign to make more people aware. And um, I'd like to thank the FCC again for allowing us to participate. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve, really appreciate it. And Diane and Kayla will join us and let's do a really quick uh, question and answer session, Steve. Um, um, why don't you, like, Steve, we get Steve up and then we'll have Diane give Steve's question. 
Well, Steve, I'm curious, what do you, you gave a lot of tips as did the previous presenters. What do you think is the best thing someone can do to prevent being taken advantage of by a scammer? The best thing someone can do is not pay with the gift card because you may believe what they say, hook, line, and sinker, but to complete the transaction, they need to get money from you. And the reason they want to use gift cards or, to, or, or these stored value cards is it's virtually impossible to trace them. So when you go down to the store and you bring them back and you read the, the codes to them, you've lost your money. If you don't do that, if you stop yourself from doing that, they're not going to be able to complete the transaction. That's the best thing that people can do. You should never, ever pay any of these um, clowns and scammers with any kind of gift card because gift card equals scam in this context. There's no question about it. I'm going to ask you a quick follow-up question, though. How do you verify someone is who they claim to be? Because that example you gave regarding the doctor being called from the court, I mean, that does sound pretty plausible and scary. You know, these, these scammers are really good at what they do. So really, the only the best thing you, you can do is you initiate the, the verification yourself. And you don't do it by, by calling the number or going to the website that the, the person gives to you. As, um, as the representative from the FCC said, what you do is you look in the yellow pages, you look online, you see what the publicly available telephone number is, and you call that number. If you're getting something from Amazon, for instance, and they're, they're telling you all this nonsense about, you know, you, you've been charged for this iPhone that you know you didn't pay, you don't call the number that they that the scammers provide or the telephone the person go to the website go online go in the in other the phone book and use that number because then again you've you've short circuited the scam all right i believe Lyle has a question for kayla now yeah thank you thank you diane so kayla you know um we've gone around the country and talked to folks about this problem and been really pervasive all over the country. Um, what are sort of the three, four, or five tips that we want to leave consumers with beyond those great tips that Steve provided to help consumers combat spoofing and robocalls? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, and, and yes, we've traveled around the country giving a, a lots of advice to consumers. Um, one of the things, and there, there are a lot of tips, Steve mentioned quite many of them, um, but uh, some of the general tips are, if you see a number on your caller ID that you really don't recognize, just don't pick up. I know it's hard for a lot of us to not pick up the phone, and especially those of us that grew up with, um, it's not polite to not answer a call. But given everything that's happening today, if you see a number of your call ID, again, please, that you don't recognize, don't pick up. If it really isn't a scam um, and someone leaves a voicemail, you can try to call back. But oh, a note of caution on voicemails, which is the next tip. Sometimes scammers are really sophisticated and will leave you some type of voicemail. And um, It'll say something along the lines of, you know, call us back, this is an emergency, press the number here to opt out. All those types, it should be red flags for consumers. Um, we have to be really careful about those, those type of calls too. Also, if you do pick up, because some of us don't even look at our phone anymore, we just pick up and answer the call. And you hear a suspicious, some kind of suspicious voice that you don't recognize or that starts asking you right away for personal information, like your social security number or a bank account, just hang up. Uh, those type of calls, it, that's a red flag that it's probably a scammed call. And also there are a lot of call blocking tools that you can talk to your provider about. Um, most of them are e easily to install on your phone. If you still have a landline at home, definitely talk to your provider about that. Uh, how to get some of these call blocking tools. And finally, you know, um, we talk, I talked about a little bit about neighbor spoofing and that's a good one to repeat. 
sometimes numbers do look very legitimate. It looks like a neighborhood phone number. And yes, it, it may be, but if you're not, again, if you're not certain about it, just do not pick up the call. So I think that's really correct. And so for Diane in particular, in the um, beat that you have at KITV, when Kayla and I are on the road talking to seniors, we find a real generational uh, mindset change, right? So they and I grew up, because uh, I'm approaching senior, not to be rude, right? Don't be rude. Don't not answer the call. And it, if you grew up in that era with that mindset, it is such a challenge to not answer the call, to not give the scammer the benefit of the doubt. And so for those of us who are working in this area, Steve, Kayla, the rest of our um, great panel that's, that's coming up, I think one of our jobs is also for those who are watching and those who are on the panel, we have to be ambassadors for our kupuna so that um, a friendly face to grandma and grandpa and a trusted face is the one that's delivering the news. And that way we can help arm them as well. So thank you all of us for this panel. We are gonna turn the program over again to Diane, take it away. Okay, thank you. Oh, we're gonna hear next from the Hawaii Department of Human Services, uh, Joseph Campos starts first, he's the deputy director and then he will be tossing it over himself to Amanda Stevens, who is the public information officer. And they're going to talk about their work on helping to helping consumers with education and assistance in dealing with road calls. Joseph. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Lyle. Um, thank you for inviting the Department of Human Services to participate in this webinar of spoofing and robocalls and to give an overview of the department and some examples of spoofing that DHS has encountered. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give people a sense of the Department of Human Services, our vision is that the people of Hawaii are thriving. And our mission is to encourage self-sufficiency and support the well-being of individuals, families, and communities in Hawaii. Next slide. So DHS pre-pandemic served approximately one in four Hawaii residents. A DHS currently during the pandemic serves one in three Hawaii residents. Next slide. DHS is made primarily of four divisions. A BESD, which is benefit employment and support services. They handle financial assistance, SNAP, low income emergency assistance, child care subsidies, et cetera. A MedQuest, also known as MQD, they handle the medical insurance coverage, Medicaid, premium subsidies, long-term care, age blind and disabled, as well as other items. Uh, DVR, which is our division of vocational rehab, uh, handles independent living programs, state rehabilitation council, Pono services for the blind, and employment training, and SSD, social services division, handles our child welfare services, as well as our adult protective services. Next slide, please. In addition to the four primary divisions, we do have attached agencies commissions. Uh, the agencies that are attached are the Hawaii Public Housing Authority, Office of Youth Services, Hawaii Youth Correctional Facility, and the Youth Commission. Other commissions are the Hawaii State Commission on the Status of Women, and Hawaii State Commission on Fatherhood. In addition, we do have the Hawaii Interagency Council on Homelessness and the Governor's Coordinator on Homelessness. Next slide. So for our BESD program, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, this is just an example of how many people the Department of Human Services through BESD um, you know, has serviced over the past uh, at least two years during the pandemic. Um, we started off at about 79,705 households in November of 19, uh, 19 sorry, November of 2019. Um, and uh, at the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020, uh, we were still at about 79,000. And then in April, we went up to 89,000, 
which has steadily increased to the height in August of 2021, uh, servicing 112,000 households. Next slide, please. Our MedQuest division, and we can go to the next slide, uh, started uh, in March with uh, March of 2020, with servicing uh, 327,000 uh, participants, and now we see that we are servicing uh, 430,000 participants. Uh, so that's been an increase of uh, about 130,000. Uh, uh, 103,000 uh, participants. And out of the 132,000 participants that um, applied for Medicaid assistance during the pandemic, 78% of them were eligible. Next slide, please. So our vocational rehab division or division of vocational rehab, uh, just to give people some sense of what DVR does, DVR provides vital services to build workforce parity for individuals with disabilities and barriers to employment. Pre-pandemic, just 39% of Hawaii's residents with disabilities between 16 and 64 years of age uh, were engaged in Hawaii's workforce as compared to 62% of employment rate for non-disabled adults. Uh, next slide. And so our social services divisions discuss or you know, address adult protective services as well as our child welfare services. But for the purposes of this webinar, we wanted to give you just three examples of some of the spoofing that we have experienced or witnessed with some of our vulnerable adults through the adult protective services. So the first example is that DHS had a case uh, where the victim of a spoofing scheme was a retired police officer who over the years started to show some early signs of dementia. His family members were concerned because he was engaging with spoofers and he was tricked into sending them money. Our role was to help guide his family in having him evaluated and then getting control over the bank accounts to protect his assets from further exploitation. Another example that DHS was aware of uh, was that we've had clients who attempt to wire money out of country to scammers. A DHS has been able to intervene with the support of their family uh, to stop those transactions. And to prevent these types of situations, we often find ourselves educating family members and assisting them uh, with how to obtain power of attorney or to set up joint accounts so that they can monitor their elders' bank account um, and bank transactions in the event that someone tries to scam them. Um, our message to them is that once the money is gone, you'll likely never be able to get it back and therefore prevention through education and monitoring is key. Uh, the third example is DHS had a client who had a million dollars in her bank account and scammers were able to connect with her and trick her into sending them money. Uh, her family made efforts to stop scamming uh, by changing her phone number, but somehow the scammers still were able to find uh, the person. Uh, she repeatedly wired money to the scammers. A report was made to Adult Protective Services. Uh, during the investigation and multiple, multiple interviews, uh, Adult Protective Services staff were able to observe her phone ringing. And during the conversation, she would agree to send money. After numerous interviews and discussions, Adult Protective Services staff determined that the client appeared to be in need of a, capac uh, of a capacity assessment due to her decline in abilities. After the assessment, it was determined that she in fact did not have the capacity to make financial decisions and or care for herself. A family member was then able to become her guardian and together with APS stopped the scammers from contacting her again. This preserved the balances of her finances for her care 
and the family was very appreciative of adult protective services intervention. So those are just three examples of what DHS has experienced and witnessed. And I just also want to share, you know, that this is not only affecting uh, vulnerable adults. I myself was uh, um, uh, targeted in one of our um, mobile companies uh, platforms that allowed uh, different uh, devices to enter your phone. And uh, somehow a different device uh, answered my phone. They were able to get my information, uh, cash a check of $7,000. Luckily my bank's insurance company you know, covered it. But so I just wanted to emphasize the fact that this can happen to anybody. Uh, so with that said, I'll turn it over to Amanda Stevens, the Department of Human Services Public Information Officer, who will be able to share a little bit more information on the type of spoofing that DHS has been uh, made aware of specifically. Thank you, Amanda. Mahalo. Um, thank you again for having us. Um, one of the things that I wanted to emphasize was the fact that um, interagency cooperation has been such a key um, factor in us being able to identify problems like this and to take quick action and to um, be able to, you know, share this information with the media. So I'm happy to share with you the next slide that shows um, an example of a notification that we received from the Employment Law Division. We worked closely with the, their Attorney General, um, Deputy Attorney General, to not only identify this problem, but to um, raise awareness of it. And next slide, please. This one came soon after um, the stay-at-home orders. So this was so problematic because there, as, as Joseph um, had shared, or Deputy, um, Deputy Director had shared that there's about 50,000 more individuals on SNAP since the stay at home orders. And maybe some of those folks are not used to the fact that DHS does not reach out to our clients through text messaging. Um, that's one of the things that made it really problematic. Thankfully, we were able to uh, get this screenshot from one of our clients. And I worked directly with the governor's office to be able to share um, a graphic on the social media distribution channels of the governor. We also, next slide please. We were also able to put out a press release. Um, we worked with our media partners to be able to get the word out immediately and happy to say that all of the you know, television stations um, were able to um, share this vital information with our clients. Next slide, please. Some of the resources that we have are listed on the Department of Human Services website. Um, if you click onto the SNAP recertification, SNAP application, and SNAP updates, you'll see that. We also have it in different areas. And next slide. As soon as we, we received the SNAP um, sort of, or the SNAP um, scam um, screenshot, we were able to work alongside with our federal partners, pull up this information, add it onto our website, and um, anytime someone had a question about this, we were able to share it. Next slide, please. And thank you to the FCC. Um, Lyle and his team for sharing this very useful information with us. We have this on our website and we encourage anyone to really take a look at what, um, what is, is here because you never know when this can happen to anyone. Um, those that we serve are already in vulnerable situations and to have this happen to them it just adds on more trauma to them. And so whatever we can do to help um, we want to continue to do that, and we believe that these resources um, will do so. Thank you. Next slide. And we want to say mahalo for um, giving us this opportunity 
to present this important information. Thanks. Thank you. I uh, really appreciate that uh, really wonderful uh, presentation and a really thorough look at the department. I think we're all working together to make things happen. I bring to the um, floor now our next speaker. Uh, the Hawaii State Library, Library System is one of the best library systems that we've seen in our travels. We travel a lot around the country. And because of that, um, when we come across all of the different things that the Hawaii State Library uh, System is doing, it's just like, it really makes me proud to be from Hawaii. So joining us is Stacy Aldrich. And Stacy, thank you for joining us. Why don't you tell us about the library system and um, your work in terms of consumer support and consumer awareness on problems in uh, robocalls? Mahalo, uh, Lyle, Lyle. Thank you so much. Um, mahalo Nui Lua for inviting us to join you today and talk a little bit about what libraries can do. And I just want to say to you and to the FCC, we're very grateful for all the work that you do in supporting connectivity and safety in this new age of the 21st century and communication. And when we think about our public libraries, we're definitely the place, your place, to connect and to also find opportunities and opportunities to learn and grow and and figure out what's going on in the world because there's just so much going on and it's hard to keep track of all these things that are happening, including the spoofing and the robocalls. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, when we think about our Hawaii State Public Library system, you know, 21st century libraries have two doors. We have physical doors and we have digital doors. Our physical doors are places where people can be. Our digital doors are where you can access all kinds of resources. And then we have amazing people who are here to help you through um, email, through a phone call, or even on, um, on site. So when we think about physical, uh, next slide, please. Um, this is an actual picture of our Nanakuli library. Uh, we have collections of books that you can come and check out. We have computers that you can use. Um, we now have ukuleles. And then we have places where people can gather, um, not in large groups right now because of the pandemic, but um, we do have spaces for us all to come together and to have conversation. Um, I wanna thank the FCC as we think about connections and technology and the internet, because we are, are benefiting from um, E-rate funds that are going to improve our connectivity in all 51 locations across six islands here in Hawaii. So our physical places are very important and they're places where we can connect with the people and we can have access to resources. If we go to our digital, next slide, please. We have access to a lot of things. If you can't make it to the library, you can always download an ebook or an e audiobook, or you can actually uh, stream movies um, from our Canopy subscription that we have, or do um, ancestry research on ancestry.com, or learn more about what's happening in your community. We have a community section um, where we partner with people. And we also have a spotlight section to highlight things that are happening in the community and resources that are available. And then we also have access to all kinds of newspapers. Um, uh, click please, <laughs> um, like the New York Times. Um, and we also have Press Reader, which has um, access to more than 6,000 newspapers and magazines from around the world. Um, and you can get more information on various topics. So if you want to keep up with uh, what's happening with technology and spoofing and robocalls, you can set up little searches that will search across all of the magazines on Press Reader and the, and the newspapers, and it'll show you all the articles um, about what's being written about those things. So we have all these amazing resources that can help you better understand what's, um, you know, any information that you're looking for on health or edu education, or just do you have a personal curiosity um, in terms of making things, being a maker, the library really is the place that has all that information. But we don't just gather it on our own. Uh, next slide, please. We also work with a community connector and we work with partners like the FCC and local and state officials to bring forth information that's important for everybody in our community to know. Um, we have handouts in our libraries um, related to things like fire ant tests and um, 
also information about local resources for supporting kapuna or, or your children for childcare. Um, our libraries do have physical resources that you can pick up. And right now, we actually have a new resource that's from the FCC on robocalls and text. And it's just a simple uh, little handout that you'll be able to pick up at any library if you want to get more information. So it's through those connections that we really work hard to connect the community to the information that you need to know now that helps you to be safe, but also educated on what's happening in the world. Um, another example of what we've been doing with community partnerships, next slide please, is looking at digital literacy and digital know-how. Um, spoofing and robocalls are, and texts are all part of this digital age that we live in, and we want to make sure that people have the skill sets that they need to use all of these tools effectively and also to be able to protect themselves. So we've, um, we've had multiple partnerships um, with folks through our broadband hui, which um, I know um, the next speaker, Bert Lum, is going to talk a little bit about. But we've been working with partners across the state to make more um, resources available. We have North Star available through our website, which is a tool you can use to see how much you already know about the digital world. So computers, using the internet, email, um, using Microsoft Word, um, using social media. You can just take a fun quiz to figure out what you know, and then what do you need to know more about? And then you can actually take online courses or um, check on our website because there might be a in-person class available near you. So we also, um, if you um, click one more time, um, one more time, <laughs> we also have on our website right now a special page under Spotlight, which will connect you to all of the information that the FCC is trying to make sure everybody has access to, including some pretty um, in-depth uh, um, papers about how to deal with robocalls, how to protect your phone number, how to make and, and tips on how to pr protect your loved ones as well to make sure that they don't get um, scammed. I know my mother-in-law was scammed. The person asked for gift cards and it was Microsoft telling them that she had to upgrade her Microsoft and it would cost her or else um, there would be more problems. And she, the gift card is usually the key, but um, we want to make sure that people have these resources, they know what it sounds like and what to expect so that they don't they don't have problems. So please check out our website. It has links to a great little YouTube video on spoofing and robocalls from the FCC and also these amazing resources. So next slide, please. So with physical and digital doors, we create connections and opportunities for everyone um, at the public library. And next slide, please. We invite you all to connect and find opportunities at your local um, public library and um, we're here to help you make sure that you have what you need to be successful and safe in the community. Mahalo. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Stacey. And what a wonderful job the Hawaii State Library System is doing. 51 branches across the state. Um, that means there's a library near you. And, uh, and so please take advantage if you're watching us here from Hawaii of one of Stacy's branch libraries. You're blessed in the state to have what a really good system. I'm gonna turn it over now to Diane to introduce our next speaker. Okay, so uh, we are now going to talk with Bert Lum from the Hawaii State Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. And um, he also is the founder of something called Hawaii Broadband Hui, the logo of which you can see uh, behind him. Um, and so they are doing some very important work, particularly during uh, this coronavirus pandemic to provide broadband access to people. And he's gonna tie that in as to how that applies to spoofing and robocalls. Hey, mahalo Diane, mahalo Lyle and the uh, team over at the FTC for uh, putting on this webinar and enabling us to kind of, you know, connect with our, our uh, colleagues across the state and, and see how, you know, there's ways that we can, we can all work together. Now, I'm in, I'm in a DBED and we are uh, basically in a newly formed, brand new, the Hawaii Broadband and Digital Equity Office. So I wanted to walk you through a bit of a journey that, uh, you know, we as a, as a sort of fledgling startup are, are going through. Next slide.
So, you know, I, I only recently started in, in the States uh, 2018, but over the course of the first three years or so, you know, our focus was primarily on broadband infrastructure. And of course, you know, this slide kind of depicts some of the things that Hawaii needs to have in order to connect uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, so, you know, it's important to have the trans-Pacific fiber cables, the inner island fiber, the terrestrial backhaul, wireless connections, as well as rural connectivity to get folks connected uh, to the broadband network. Next slide. And then what happened in, um, in March of 2020, when the uh, pandemic hit and the uh, stay at home orders were, were issued, you know, it was a, a stark realization that, you know, now that everybody had to pretty much do whatever they needed to do from home, uh, how would they accomplish that? Now, whether it's education or healthcare or working, uh, you would need, you know, a connection. And how can we, in that, in that stay-at-home state, um, address some of those challenges that I think were brought on by the pandemic? And, and the challenge that I'm referring to is the stark realization that there exists a digital divide across the country and, and especially in here, here in Hawaii. So on uh, March 25th, 2020, we, we convened a group to try to identify what are the challenges that are being faced in our communities and what are some of the resources that we can bring to the table. And we've actually, we actually committed to meeting on a consecutive basis for the last, uh, this past Wednesday was the 83rd consecutive meeting of the Broadband Hui. And you might ask, well, what does the Broadband Hui consist of? Well, it, it consists of, of everyone involved from infrastructure standpoint to <clears throat> the nonprofits involved in delivering telehealth, uh, education, and distance learning. Uh, we, we talk a lot with our neighbor island uh, communities and, and uh, associates that are involved. And because you know, we're able to do this over Zoom, uh, it's, it's a lot easier to bring uh, to the actual broadband Hui members from the neighbor islands, as well as into the Pacific islands as well. And uh, so we address a lot of these issues. Uh, we have congressional representation, we have legislators join us, we have uh, counties join us. And, and so it's a, a, a wide uh, swath of, of uh, participation. And, and not to mention, you know, we have uh, folks from Hawaiian Telecom, we have uh, Charter, we have the, uh, all the wireless providers also on the call. And, and again, we're, we're trying to help bring together, you know, the, the need as well as the resources. And, and in essence, you know, that has been the purpose of the broadband hui. And uh, the next slide is, is something that I want to describe what came out of the hui. So as we started to talk about, you know, what is it that we really want to help achieve for Hawaii, we, we came up with something called the Digital Equity Declaration. And, and we recognize uh, through our continued meetings and as well as, uh, you know, discussions with all of our counterparts that there was sort of these three categories. And we look at, <clears throat> at um, broadband as, as an access issue, a literacy issue, and a livelihood. Livelihood is all the things that we might be doing once we are on the network, whether it's education, telehealth, working, accessing government services, so these are the things that really went into this digital equity, de digital equity declaration. And, and we wanted to set a goal for ourselves. How do we work together to bring everybody in Hawaii up to a level of competency when it comes to digital, digital access, digital literacy, and using the technology that now is at our fingertips? And so... You know, this slide, uh, obviously, we're, we're looking at all the variety, variety of projects that are going on, uh, but we're at, a, we're at the beginning stages because, you know, we recognize that I think uh, collectively, uh, many of the folks that are on the call now realize that we all have to come together and work together to achieve these goals. And, and that's, again, why I'm, I'm so appreciative for having be a part of this FCC uh, webinar. Next slide. So part of our digital equity declaration, you know, it, like I mentioned, it, it kind of uh, resulted from a, a multitude of conversations over the course of the weeks 
and and uh, you know we came to the um, point where we actually issued the declaration. We had we had not only our state legislature but also the counties all embrace the declaration in forms of uh, a resolution recognizing the digital equity declaration. And, and to emphasize again, the three key components, uh, and we sometimes refer to this as digital, uh, digital equity for all or broadband for all, the all stands for access, literacy, and livelihood. And again, we're committed to making this happen. And, and the, again, the, the goal here is how do we not only achieve this level of competency uh, and access with this technology, but how do we also bring awareness of the challenges brought up when now people are, are able to access online? And what is, is really kind of a, a key realization, having been a part of this uh, presentation, is the fact that, you know, it's not all fun and games, you know, when you get on the internet I mean, you can now understand all the challenges just by having a, a phone connection with, with spoofing and robocalls. But as you start to also embrace, you know, uh, email scams like phishing and, and cybersecurity where uh, people might try to uh, socially engineer your reveal of a, of a password uh, and, and somehow, you know, as the examples were given, take over your computer. You know, these are all really important concepts to help people understand. So as we, you know, delve into our digital equity declaration, as we start to roll out classes, and, and we've been working closely with, with Stacy and doing uh, digital literacy classes in the libraries. And, and these are classes that basically constitute things like uh, how to, you know, how to work your computer, how to do real basic one, 101 kinds of uh, access to the internet and some of the resources. I think it's, it's, it's really important that we also share some of the challenges that people might now face. And, and through this particular webinar, I think uh, you know, it, it becomes even more important for us to share with some of the new folks coming online uh, what some of the challenges they should be aware of and how to protect themselves. So whether it's, it's uh, new folks coming online or Kupuna wanting to, you know, be more connected, uh, you know, all the things that have been shared today about spoofing and robocalls, uh, we want to continue to share with, with our communities. And, and Lyle sent me a whole box of uh, these information cards and briefs that we will be getting out to um, the community. I had Lyle come on the uh, Broadband Hui yesterday and talk about it. And I have uh, already distributed uh, hundreds of copies over to the uh, Sydney County of Honolulu, as well as the County of Hawaii, and and am also working with the uh, Chamber of Commerce to share some of the digital assets that uh, they can include in some of their social media uh, messaging to help get the word out on what what uh, all of all of you on this uh, on this panel have have shared and 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 really enlightened all of us about you know the. The challenges and some of the uh, perhaps downsides of being technically connected, you know, to the rest of the world. So, again, we we want to achieve a level high levels of, of digital equity across the state of Hawaii. We also want to get uh, technology into the hands of, of people, uh, whether it's you know devices or internet access or you know the computer literacy. Uh, but we also want to make sure that they understand. Uh, that it's not a bed of roses, that there are uh, nefarious actors out there and that there should be some real conscientious effort to be aware of what it is that, that could be happening. And I would strongly take the advice uh, given from some of our earlier panels on panelists about how to really kind of protect yourself. And, and um, like my, in my case, you know, I, I rarely answer my phone if I don't recognize the number and I usually always let it go to voicemail. And if after the voicemail, it sounds like somebody that I would want to call back, I, I, I will do that. But now rarely do I ever even <laughs> answer my phone. So that's just a, 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 you know, an example of, of what I've tried to um, exercise as a, as a way to protect ourselves. But again, you know, these people are sophisticated and um, you know, I, I, just, I just need to reemphasize uh, be vigilant and be conscientious of what it is that 
uh, people are trying to access uh, from you. So thanks a lot. And, and Diane, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, so now we're gonna do a little Q&A session. If there's any uh, questions that have come in from the viewing public, I'd be happy to read them off. I don't see any at this time, but I myself have some questions based off of what Bert had just said. Actually, I'm kind of hamstrung. I have to answer my phone as a reporter because sometimes if you don't answer it, so I do answer phone calls from numbers I don't recognize. Maybe I shouldn't have said that on a public forum. <laughs> um, well, anyways, you I, know, Diane. I mean, I think I think you know. Also, I'm, I'm you're you're smart enough to know that if if somebody is talking to you on the other side of that phone, I mean, you know, you either if if it doesn't sound legit, you know, time to hang up. Yes, you're right. I'm a very suspicious person, Bert. And that is my message to the public today. I will sum up for you. Be suspicious. <laughs> be okay to be rude. Uh, so your digital equity is a little bit off topic from today's <sighs> webinar, but I do know that the HUI has been working with a lot of uh, local stakeholders and other organizations to try to get eligible households to sign up for the FCC's emergency broadband benefit. Uh, so what is that? And what can people do to figure out if they qualify? And then how do they apply? So the um, FCC, as a result of the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act, actually allocated, I think it was $3.2 billion uh, for uh, like a, a small, small subsidy for your internet service. And, and we rolled this out back in May. Uh, actually, we, what we did was uh, we helped to kind of announce the FCC program. And the whole idea is that in a, in a nutshell, you get $50 off your internet subscription if you're a qualifier. And the qualifications are pretty straightforward. I mean, you could be a SNAP recipient, a uh, Medicaid uh, uh, recipient. You could be a free or reduced lunch uh, recipient. Even if you were unemployed during the, the course of the pandemic, you could qualify. And so all of these, if you start to, you know, we start, you know, we tried to do an estimate of how many people would potentially qualify in Hawaii. It could be actually... I, I had originally estimated maybe 100,000, but it could be closer, closer to a million. Uh, right now, we, we are at something like 13,000. So there's a lot more that could be done to sign up and take advantage of this. And in essence, you, you know, for $50, it would be off your internet bill. If you're on Hawaiian Homelands, you could get $75 off, and it'll last as long as the, uh, the money lasts. So um, I would recommend that you could go to our website, uh, which is broadband.hawaii.gov forward slash EBB, and that will give you some, some quick uh, tips on uh, what you should do. And to actually get registered, you would, it would, there's a link to the FCC website that you can then go and do a, go through the national verifier. And once you've gone through the national verifier, you've gotten all the, you know, you provided the documents, then you can take that and then go to the um, carrier, whether it's the Hawaiian Telecom or Spectrum, or even the wireless folks like the Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile, and, and you could get your $50 off uh, on your internet bill. So I would highly suggest people take advantage of that. What do you think the broad... Sorry about my newsroom phone. Uh, what do you think is the broadband penetration in this state now, and has it gone up or down uh, in this pandemic? Well, you know, rough estimates... Um, as we look at things like the American uh, Community Survey, uh, they were looking at probably close to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, something like 14,000 14, around that number of, of, of households that were not connected. So there's a fair amount of households that are not connected. And you know, even, even within some of our urban areas, uh, if you look at uh, some of the public housing areas, or if you look at uh, areas out in our, even on Oahu, the rural, uh, they are not connected. And so, you know, the whole idea behind digital equity for all is, even though, you know, you may be connected, there are people that aren't connected. So how do we help to alleviate that situation? And, and of course, with the federal government um, also recognizing this challenge, uh, there are some funds to help uh, beef up our fiber infrastructure as well as the digital equity and, and uh, digital literacy. So we are definitely moving forward to try to get everybody up to speed. Uh, nobody, nobody left behind and, and try to pull all our resources from the government with the community, you know, with the, 
uh, our friends over at the FCC, all together, you know, we're going to try to move Hawaii into this uh, uh, digital equity 21st century. Yeah. Well, obviously, still a need for it. Otherwise, the broadband Hawaii wouldn't have been meeting for 82 straight weeks in a row, right? Yeah. Anything else you wanted to add, or I'm going to move over to Stacy? Oh, feel free. Stacy is my hero. Stacy, shout out to the public libraries. I grew up in the public libraries. Love to read. Um, kind of, kind of going with what Bert said about uh, digital connectivity. The FCC is currently working with the nation's schools uh, and libraries on the Emergency Connectivity Plan, or ECP. Now that is a nationwide. $17.2 billion fund to do things like fun connectivity and devices for libraries. So has our state's library system gotten any money from that fund? And if so, how much? How are you going to use that money? And particularly to support the keiki who may need uh, help like remote learning. Sorry for this 10 part question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to remember all the pieces. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you. No, we're, we're really excited. We did apply for the Emergency Connect funding, and we received one, $119,331.40, $119, yay, excitement. We can actually we can actually buy, um, what we're using the money for is to buy more, uh, about 300 Chromebooks that we'll be able to check out to the public along with some hotspots that are part of a um, telehealth initiative that we're working on with the Department of Health and with the Pacific um, Basin Telehealth Program out of the University of Hawaii. So we're, we want to make sure that communities can not only connect, but you actually have the technology. I think what we're finding in the state is people may have connectivity, but they don't have up-to-date technology to connect. Um, so we're hoping that through these programs, not only will you have access to the um, actual tech, um, you'll have connectivity as well, and then you'll have some support to help you get started so that you can be connected. So we're very excited and we're grateful to the FCC for um, providing us with this opportunity to get more devices out to the, to the public so that um, we can support um, these programs and support the health of our communities. Yeah, that's a really great point that you, you need both components. You need the wireless signal and you need the tech to be able to keep up with it, especially with all these Zoom calls. Mm -hmm. I'm um, has the library seen a need from its constituents to support children more or or patrons more in this time, in this pandemic? Um, definitely for, for internet connectivity. Um, we, we do have Wi-Fi outside of our libraries. And so we do have people who will sit in the parking lots to connect. Um, because they may not have good good connectivity at home or any connectivity at home, depending on where you live um, in Hawaii. And so it's very important um, to families. For children, it's really interesting. Um, many are getting technology through their schools. So I think the challenge is um, for a lot of parents is um, and a lot of families is having the connectivity to support multiple devices within their homes to connect to the internet so that um, they can uh, do hybrid learning. So if they have to be online, they can be online. Um, so I think what we've seen most is that now that kids are back to school, libraries, again, are really important places for resources. Um, and it's just it's not just connectivity, but it's also um, for reading and for doing um, studies and research. Okay, um, I want to be mindful of the time because we've gone past our allotted time. Now, I do know that this is a webinar, so we have endless amounts of time, but for people tuning in who may have allotted an hour, I want to hear everything that we have to say. I want to try to keep it as close as possible. So do you have any last points uh, that I failed to ask or that you wanted to mention? I think I'd just like to remind people that if you're not sure where to find information, you can always call us, you can visit us or you can, um, you, um, can be in touch with us online or use any one of our online resources with just a library card. So I'd really encourage people to take advantage of the fact that our libraries are here to connect you. To well, are all the branches open in real life now? All the branches are open except for our downtown Hawaii State Library branch. And, and uh, it's an issue with staffing that we're currently um, currently fixing. So hopefully- The picture behind you, that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were, we were actually closed for most of the pandemic because we were helping the Department of Labor 
we had staff who were working for them. <laughs> so now we're um, we're trans we're transforming the space a little bit and we're staffing up again. So thank okay, you. Thank you so much, Stacy. And let's uh, finish with the Hawaii Department of Health uh, and Human Services. Um, so Joseph, you you had some really um, compelling examples of clients who had been victim to unwanted calls. How do you and your staff help people overcome fear or shame of reporting these kinds of incidents? Thanks, Diane. Um, that's a great question. You know, I think all too often people are ashamed of being, you know, victims of fraud. You know, I, I shared my experience, uh, but you don't want to be the one that says, yeah, I was taken advantage of. Um, so one of the things that I think is important is that all of our staff throughout our divisions are extremely collaborative. So if they hear of anything, they know to contact the Adult Protective Services branch. And the Adult Protective Services staff work with their clients to address the trauma and a sense of shame that they have of being spoofed or taken advantage of by those who target the elderly and vulnerable people. Um, as part of the continuum of care and services, we work alongside with supportive family members so they are aware and can be of assistance to uh, the clients in the long term. I think that's the main thing is just to let them know that this is what's happening across the country and you know you didn't do anything wrong you know and you just had faith in people. Yeah, I do see that too as a reporter that I can't get people to talk to me about real life examples because they're embarrassed. And um, I think that one of the things that people like yourself have either related to me or to them is, you know, by stepping forward and sharing your story, you're helping somebody else. And by reporting it, you're also helping like create this uh, statistical database so that government can figure out how bad the problem is, right? Definitely. Yeah. Um, Amanda, you and I work together a lot as well in your role as a PIO uh, for DHS. And so I understand that the media uh, component is one part of letting the public know about spoofing or robocalls. Uh, what do you think is the most effective type of communication when trying to help people? Thank you, Diane. That's a really good question. And, and listening to Bert and Stacy, first of all, you know, access to connectivity and to, you know, and that electronic devices is key. Um, knowledge is power. And if those we serve don't have access to this information, then it leaves them even more vulnerable. So we look at it through collaboration with uh, agencies and nonprofits, but when it comes to media, it's kind of like a one-two punch between social media and traditional media. Primarily, um, I can tell you, we've had really good success utilizing the social media distribution channels from governor's office. Um, there's so many Facebook groups who advocate for you know, those who are in need. There's um, a lot of parent groups. There's so many groups that have picked up the information that we posted and shared it. Also, you know, just being able to have folks like you able to put this information on your website for your, um, for your news and then being able to share that. And, and Stacy and, and your librarians, thank you so much for providing the access for um, those that we serve to be able to apply for the programs and services. And then they're able to look at your bulletin boards and see if there's any alerts and you know, many of um, those we serve have been able to access um, connectivity because of all that you've done, Bert, as well. So it, it's, it really is cooperation, but it's a mix of social media and traditional media. Yeah, I remember working with you on the Snap text scam that became a news story a couple of times with follow-ups. And I understand that it is alarming, especially since now you're saying that your department is serving more people for assistance during COVID. That just means that that many more people vulnerable uh, to becoming victims that can't afford it. Absolutely. All right, anything else that um, Joseph or Amanda wants to say before we wrap it up? 
Okay, so the FC, we're going to thank everyone here today. Thank you so much for um, just presenting all this really important information. We have uh, Joseph Campos, Deputy Director, and Amanda Stevens, Public Information Officer from the Hawaii Department of Human Services, Stacy Aldridge, the Hawaii State Librarian, Bert Lama of the Hawaii State Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism and Steve Levins from the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs Office of Consumer Protection. <laughs> you went for longest title, Steve. <laughs> so thank you, Diane. And, our, and on the FCC side, we'd like to thank um, Kayla hernandez Ujoa, who is the Associate Chief of our division, the Consumer Affairs and Outreach Division. And hidden behind the scenes are just a group of really talented people who manipulate Zoom to try and make it as, as uh, friendly to the public as possible. Our superstars are Gerard Williams, who produced and directed this webinar, DeAndrea Wilson, who is working our um, open email line, Jeff Reardon and Steve Balderson, who curate the, the Zoom stream into FCC.gov live. And actually my boss, Ed Bartholomew, this is a new idea. Government is are not really known to accept new ideas, but he's really supportive of this targeted um, webinar. And so Ed, really appreciate it. And finally, I just want to thank you, Diane. So thank you for lending us your, your knowledge, your experience, your credibility, and so your local uh, connections and stories. Um, and with that, I will close with two points. One, if you're watching us not from Hawaii, and maybe we had sent you a see this solicitation email. This is our target. This kind of really wonderful webinar is what the FCC would like to try and suggest for you. So Diane, we did a really good job for Hawaii. Go ahead, you're saying Thank something. Thank you. Oh, so you're saying that email is not spam. Go ahead and open it. Yeah, please, but you know, <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> and then uh, secondly, um, if anyone from Hawaii has additional questions or people from the continent as a result of this, outreach at fcc.gov is how you can um, reach our entire team. And so and with all that, the good links. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so with that, Diane, thank you very much to the general public. Thank you for joining us today. Have a really awesome. wonderful day. Malamapuno. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye.